A fly comes to rest on a fallen twig. Its eyes scan in almost 360 degrees, because when you are a third of an inch long, danger is everywhere. When your predators are smarter, faster, and sometimes even more maneuverable than you are, the insect world can be a terrifying place. But what this fly hasn't taken into account is the certain doom lurking below. He's come to rest over a mat of bloodthirsty plants, their mouths gaping, waiting silently for the free protein that curious insects provide. Recharged, the fly zips away, off to find something rotting to eat never coming within chomping distance of the horrifying vegetation below. But not all the insects in this forest are so lucky. Littered about this mat of Venus flytraps are the withered husks of their victims, as well as some recent catches who haven't gotten the memo that the more they struggle, the faster they'll die. But why have plants turned into ruthless killing machines? And why have so many different types of carnivorous plants emerged across the globe? To find out exactly what's going on with these unique life forms, and to see why they're a lot less alien than you might think, we're going to embark on a journey into an insect's worst nightmare. Welcome to the secret world of carnivorous plants. <laughs> Roughly 85% of Earth's landmass is covered in plants. There are more trees on this planet than there are stars in our galaxy. More blades of grass than there are individual hairs on all the world's animals combined. For the vast majority of plants, they synthesize their own food too, using a complex chemical reaction we all learn in our high school biology classes. Whether they're standing majestically for centuries in a forest, or creating decorative accents in your garden, it's no exaggeration to say that plants are some of the most successful life forms on the planet. But despite their passive nature, hidden deep within the DNA of all plants is the recipe for violence. And quite a few of them have decided to give in to the dark side over their millennia in our world. A lone carpenter ant makes her way across the forest floor. She is a scout for her colony, foraging for resources to help feed her brood as they build out their insect metropolis. Today, she is in unfamiliar territory. Previous hunting grounds have dried up for the fall, so she must venture further into the unknown. She leaves a chemical trail as she goes, breadcrumbs for future ants that will follow, and for her to return if she does find something promising. Her antennae probe the ground and the air, hoping for a trace of something edible. She picks up something, something sweet, something promising. She follows the scent to the edge of a bog and realizes that it's these funny looking plants that have been gently wafting their sweet scent on the breeze. Nectar would be a very welcome find this time of year when no flowers are blooming. Rich in sugar and calories, her brood will be very grateful. She climbs up into the plant's embrace, hoping to find the source of this wonderful smell. As she searches, almost methodically, she finds herself drawn to the odd-shaped leaves at the end of the plant's stalks. As she walks onto these leaves, they suddenly snap shut around her. Confused, she struggles, but the plant only increases its grip. If her eyes could widen with fear, they would be wild. She continues to fruitlessly struggle, which only entices the plant more, and the leaf is flooded with digestive juices that eat her away while she is still alive. She wasn't the first victim of this carnivorous bog, and she won't be the last, as many of her sisters will follow her trail right into the jaws of doom. This is real. I know the idea of plants eating meat makes for great horror and science fiction, but yeah, these are real. And they might be living closer than you'd think. Check this out right here. Now, this is not exactly what we're looking for, but these are very special. Probably like, what are you doing in the South American jungle? Carnivorous plants don't grow here. Well, uh, you're actually wrong. I'm in northern Florida in a temperate longleaf pine forest, and I'm staring at pitcher plants. If carnivorous plants were restricted to the tropics, I wouldn't be surprised. The most biodiverse regions of the world are bound to have a ton of competition for resources. We see the most venomous snakes and spiders, unbelievable camouflage, and even some of the weirdest animals on the planet. So it's no secret that life has to get creative to find a way down there. Why not evolve to eat 
insects if you're a plant trying to make a living in some remote jungle. But that's not what we see. Carnivorous plants range all the way into the Arctic, so something else is going on here. If it really were about competition for resources, we'd expect to see a lot more carnivorous plants out in the tropics, where it's a lot more biodiverse, but we actually see the opposite. Most carnivorous plants, especially here in the United States, live in scrub habitat and peat bogs, where the entire understory gets scorched by natural fires, leaving acidic, barren soil. It seems that carnivory in plants is less about competition for resources than it is an adaptation to scarcity. So why is eating bugs the answer? And how do plants even develop that ability? The clues lie in how plants actually make their food. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide from the air, and sunlight helps catalyze a reaction that converts the gas to sugars the plants use for energy. But the carbon stores in plants are also used for structure. Most of the body mass that plants have comes from the carbon in the atmosphere. However, carbon isn't the only building block they need. Plants need nitrogen. It's why we buy plant food for our gardens. The nitrogen-rich supplements help them to synthesize the proteins they need to undergo photosynthesis. So in order to build their bodies up, they need nitrogen as well as carbon. While there's tons of nitrogen in our atmosphere, it's not in a form they can easily use. Most plants get their nitrogen from the soil, where it's absorbed by the roots. But when there's little to no nitrogen in the soil, where are plants going to get this vital nutrient? You see where I'm going with this? While the leaves of carnivorous plants look very different, they all share one characteristic, the ability to absorb nutrients. And it's not just one random mutation that happened once and was passed down. Carnivory has evolved many times in completely different lineages of plants around the world. Pitcher plants aren't related to sundews, and sundews are only distantly related to Venus flytraps. It sounds really complex, but what's crazy is they're not actually using any abilities that aren't already available to most plants. See, insects have exoskeletons that are comprised of a compound called chitin, and it turns out a very similar compound makes up the structure of fungi. A lot of plants have an enzyme for breaking down chitin, but usually it's used as more of an immune response to defend themselves against parasitic fungi, but carnivorous plants have just kind of tweaked the recipe so they can break down the shells of insects. Most plants also have enzymes that help them absorb nutrients, like the nitrogen they need to undergo photosynthesis. Most of the time, those receptors are in the roots, but with carnivorous plants, they've moved it to the leaves. This remodeling of genomes is something science finds perplexing, but it gives us a glimpse at some evolutionary mechanisms that help to shape adaptations to extreme conditions. And the fact that this same phenomenon has occurred in completely unrelated lineages means that not only are carnivorous plants an example of convergent evolution, but that being carnivorous in nutrient-poor environments is actually a really advantageous survival strategy. And when you can't move to hunt your prey, you're gonna need really cunning traps to make sure the bugs you're eating stay put long enough to actually be a reliable source of food. There are many different types you might come across, but the most common are pitfall traps, glue traps, and the infamous snap traps of the Venus flytraps. Venus flytraps are crazy, but how do they work in the first place? Well, these leaves are kind of shaped like a mouth. And it's like I always say, appearances of things we see in nature can kind of give us clues as to their biology. So if it looks like a mouth, it probably acts like a mouth, right? And if I stick my finger in it, sure enough, the plant can actually bite me. But it doesn't hurt or anything, it's just literally just a leaf closing around my finger, but it feels really strange. You can actually feel the pressure of that leaf closing as the structure changes. What's funny is they actually have similar enzymes to what we see in our stomachs, a lot of meat digesting juices. That being said, even if you did keep your finger in a Venus flytrap for the hours and hours that it would take for it to digest, it really will give you a faint buzzing sensation at most. Carnivorous plants are definitely not big enough nor potent enough to actually eat people. But how does the plant know what's food? Not far from where our ant was devoured, a grasshopper has been disturbed by a predator. Using its long hind legs, it launches itself to safety, or so it thinks. Its slender appearance and drab color give it impeccable camouflage in these mats of vegetation, but camouflage won't save him if his predator isn't relying on sight. Slowly, the grasshopper crawls forward to check if the coast is clear, but in doing so, he trips a hair on the leaf of a Venus flytrap. The grasshopper doesn't know it, but a lethal countdown has begun. 
These hairs that line the traps act like tripwires. When touched, they stretch the structure of the leaf, flooding it with charged particles stored within. This flood of ions will dissipate if left alone, but a second trigger in under 30 seconds causes a chain reaction that closes the trap. The unlucky grasshopper didn't know this, and in its very act to check for its original attacker, became plant food. As metal as these plants are, this isn't a common sight anymore. The Venus flytrap is native to the coast of the Carolinas, but over the years their numbers have dwindled to the point where they are endangered in their native range. Human development has decimated the usable habitat, and poaching has done the rest. They're one of the most unique secrets the natural world has to offer, but aside from captive breeding and a few invasive pockets of them across the eastern seaboard, they're becoming rarer and rarer. I'll definitely say that they are one plant that I've always wanted to make a video about, but I never actually expected to be able to work with them in the wild. So imagine my surprise when I'm hiking in a random forest in Florida and I come across this. What? You're seeing the same thing I'm seeing, right? That, that's a Venus flytrap. There aren't too many plants that can make me this excited. I know I usually film lots of crazy, venomous, biting things, but this is actually a plant that can bite you. What I have right here is the Venus flytrap, probably one of the most iconic carnivorous plants in the world. And what's crazy is you don't see them like this in the wild too often anymore because in their native range, they've been completely wiped out. Their habitat destroyed and the leftover populations just completely stolen from the wild because they're so popular in the plant trade. But I'm not in their native range right now. I was really shocked that I even stumbled upon these out here. I'm in Northern Florida. I'm out here like hiking. I'm like, I see the, I, I'm like, I see the sundews and stuff. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Hike a little bit further up. And the next thing you know, I'm seeing these little spiny traps looking back at me. And I'm like, did I take a wrong turn? For years, carnivorous plants have captured my imagination. They've turned the natural order on its head and continue to be the subjects of groundbreaking research around the world. The more we learn about what makes these unusual plants tick, the more we learn about how life evolved and continues to evolve on our planet. The more we unlock the secrets of our natural world. What plants will become carnivorous next? And how can we use their genome remodeling to revolutionize our understanding of biology as a whole? Only time will tell. Because of all the secrets they hide, more work is definitely needed on carnivorous plants to continue to understand their really unusual biology. But while they're pretty awesome examples of adaptation to extreme conditions, they don't take it quite as far as another creature does. You can't see them with the naked eye, but living in your yard right now is probably the most invincible animal on the planet. So tough that it can survive in the vacuum of space. If you want to learn more about the incredible tardigrade, check out this video right here. Hope to see you there, but until next time, don't forget to get outside and find your own adventure.